So imagine a sporting competition where every team didn't get to play every other team. Could you figure out who was the best team in a competition like that? Dominance matrices will let us do it. So here's my very simple competition. Uh, four teams, A, B, C, and D, and they only got to play two games each. So A beat B and C. B obviously lost to A, but they beat D. And D uh, beat C. Um, okay, so, so now that we've got that out of the way, we can draw this up using what's called a dominance uh, network. So I can put in A, B, C, D. And now I draw edges depending on who won or lost. So A beat B. So I draw a line between A and B because they played a game. And the arrow goes in the direction of um, whoever's being dominated, right? So B was dominated by A. Uh, here we've got the same here. There was a game between A and C. And A beat C. So the arrow goes in that direction. All right. Uh, B beat D. So they played a game. Uh, B dominated D. So an arrow goes towards D here. And then uh, D beats C. So they played a game. And D dominated C. So the arrow goes in the direction of the person that was dominated. Okay, so now we have this little network here. Um, now, you can probably pause for a minute and think about who the best team is, who the worst team is, and you probably might have an idea about who the second and third best teams are as well. Uh, but imagine if this wasn't four teams, imagine if this was 20 teams, and imagine they each played 15 games each. That network's going to get really out of control, so we need a better way to do it, and the better way to do it is to draw up a matrix. All right, here's our matrix. Now, we've got A. A doesn't play A, right? You can't play yourself, so we'll call that a zero. B plays B, that's a zero. C plays C, that's a zero. And D plays D, that's a zero. And that's going to happen whenever you create one of these matrices. Teams don't play themselves. Okay, let's see. A beats B. Now, we move in this direction, right? Uh, so if A beats B, A beats B, then we put a 1 here. That's, a, that's one win for A. Now, conversely, B lost to A. So we don't count that as a win. It's going to be a 0. Let's continue with the whole A column, right? So A beats C. So that's a win for A. And A didn't play D. Now, I'm just going to draw in an N there for now. Um, it should really be a zero, right? So I'm writing in an N, but I'll replace it with a zero in a second. That just denotes that they didn't play a game. That's not what we do. Okay, finally, we can say that A has like two points, right? That makes sense, two points in total. Uh, now, I'll just fill in B here. B beat D, so B beat D, they get one point there. And B and C never played, so I'm going to put a little N in there. And again, that's not what you do. Okay, that's a 1. Now, C, well, there's some symmetry going on here, right? Like, C lost to A, so C gets a 0 here. C uh, and B never played, so there's an N there. And we know that D beats C, which means that C lost to D, 0. C gets 0 points. Okay, and finally, D beats C, so there's a 1 there, D beats C, but um, D and A never played, don't put it in there, and then a 0, and D gets 1 point. Okay, at this stage we have done a single step dominance matrix, and we can see that A has clear dominance here, it's the best team, it's won two games. Uh, B and D are tied on one game apiece, and C is the worst team. They have not won a single game. Now, the big question here, and the question that dominance matrices are good at answering is, who's better, B or D? Now, if you look at the network, you probably already have an idea about this, but again, this scales up really, really nicely. So, the way that we can get around this is... Uh, to take this matrix and multiply it by itself. Uh, it's pretty clever, so I want to show you why multiplying this matrix by itself allows us to split B and D. All right, so here I have it, the matrix multiplied by itself. In other words, the matrix squared. We could have just written to the power of 2 here, but I'm putting them next to each other because I want us to see it element by element, what's happening. 
Now, what we're going to create is second-hand wins. Okay, so you've beaten a team, that team's beaten someone else, so there's a probably a pretty good probability that you would also be able to beat that team, that the team that you beat, beat. Okay, so let's do the multiplication. Um, 0 times 0, 1 times 0, 1 times 0, 0 times 0, that's row times column, that's going to give me 0. All right, 0 times 1, 1 times 0, 1 times 0, 0 times 0, that's going to give me 0. And this is going to happen a lot. Uh, 0 times 1, 1 times 0, 1 times 0, 0 times 1, that's going to give me 0. And finally, 0 times 0, 1 times 1, oh, that's important. All right, let's leave that for a second. 1 times 0, 0, 0 times 0, 0. Okay, this is the first time that when you multiply the row by the column, you don't get 0, you get 1. What does that 1 represent? Okay, let's see what's happening. We've got A, B, C, D here. 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 Now, let's look at the single moment where that one appeared. A beats A, which doesn't, like A plays A, doesn't, A doesn't play A. So zero times zero, that doesn't do anything. All right, what about this bit here? One times one, okay. This one here represents the moment that A beat B. A beat B. This one here represents the moment that B beat D. So, by multiplying these together, 1 times 1 and getting 1, we're saying if A beat B, which it did, that's why a 1 exists there, and if um, B, B beat D, and that's why the 1 exists there, then A must be capable of beating D. There's our second-hand win. That's the whole point of this dominance matrix. So we get to put a 1 in there. A has a second-hand win over D, a second-order win over D. So now it's clear from this matrix multiplication that A beat B, A beat C, and if they played, a would probably be capable of beating D. I'm using probably because who knows what happens on game day. Okay, I'm going to multiply the rest of these. A bunch of zeros are going to appear, uh, but there might be some times when we want to stop and take a look at uh, a particular one because of a second-hand win. Okay, I see one, I see one. All right, let's take a look at what happens here. Um, zero times one, zero times zero, zero times zero, 1 times 1. Okay, let's think about that second-hand win. We've got B beating D. That's what this one represents. B wins against D. And then this one represents the moment that D beats C. So if B beats D and D beats C, then B is probably capable of beating C. So we get a nice second-hand win here for B being capable of beating C. These don't happen that often in this matrix, so we should celebrate when they do. Okay, I'm going to keep going until I see any other second-hand win. All right, uh, I think I'm pretty well finished here. I've done the matrix, I've done the matrix squared, and what I get when I like take the matrix and then square the matrix is uh, a situation where A has a second-hand win over D, and B has a second-hand win over C. And C and D don't have any second-hand wins. All right, so going right back to the very beginning, A is the best because it beat B and C, clearly, but using our uh, second-order dominance matrix, we can say that A can also beat D as well. Okay, uh, coming back to here, we can say that B had one, but B also has a second-hand win over C. So that might mean that B is slightly better than D, who only had one win, just like B did in the beginning. All right, so how do I kind of formalize this down here? Well, this is kind of art and science, because this is a dominance matrix, and you can decide what, um, what kind of sport you're talking about, or what kind of thing you're talking about, and how to best apply your dominance matrix. So here's a way to apply your dominance matrix. We can say that the new matrix is going to be equal to the uh, first dominance matrix 
plus uh, the dominance matrix squared, which is uh, this one here. So if we take that matrix, which shouldn't have any ends in it, and I write it in here, and then I take that and I write the same thing but square it, which is going to result in that. And if I were then to take those and add them together, I would get, uh, let's take that matrix and add that matrix. Let's see what that looks like. Okay, there's the original matrix, there's the matrix squared. If I add them together, uh, 0, 1, 1, 1, and you can see this is combining the first order and second orders here, right? Uh, Mr. One here. Zero, 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 and zero, zero, one, zero. Now I can say that A gets three points, B gets two points, C gets zero points, and D gets one point. I have some clear winners here. A is the best, B is the second best, D is the third best, and C is the worst. Whew! Okay, um, now, this works really, really well for some things, but not for other things. So, you really need to decide, is a second-hand win just as good as a first-hand win? Because maybe it isn't. Maybe, like, just because, like, you beat someone doesn't mean that you're likely to beat the other person. Maybe they have completely different skills and your skills don't line up with their skills, whatever. So, my point is, maybe a second-hand skill, a second-hand win, is not as equal as a first-hand win. So, you can create a different formula. You can instead say that M equals the initial dominance matrix plus only half of the dominance matrix squared. Because, well, you know, they're, maybe they're only worth half. Maybe a second-hand win actually isn't worth much at all, depending on the sport, and maybe we shouldn't weight them that way. Maybe we should weight them a bit more like this. Maybe it should only be worth a quarter if you beat someone. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground here. There's still a little bit to talk about in terms of dominance matrices. Uh, so I'm just going to wipe all of this stuff off, and let's continue. So I've got rid of everything here except for my two models of dominance that I've talked about. One way that you can do it is to say, take your dominance matrix and then add the square of your dominance matrix, which allows second-hand wins to be counted equally as good as a first-hand win. Okay, my second model here is take your dominance matrix, add half of the dominance matrix squared, which means that second-hand wins are only worth half as much as first-hand wins. Both good models. There are millions of other dominance models as well that you can use. You can decide how important a second-hand win is. But what would have happened if you took your dominance matrix, then you found your second-hand win, and then you still had some people that were on equal points? Well, why stop at second-hand wins when you could also use third-hand wins? And you can do that just by raising your dominance matrix to the power of 3. So, we could create a dominance matrix that looked like this, or a dominance model that looked like this. Dominance matrix plus the dominance matrix squared, which gives you your second-hand wins, plus the dominance matrix cubed, which gives you your third-hand wins. You beat someone who beat someone who beat someone, therefore you're better than that person who got beaten over there. Now, what if third-hand wins aren't worth very much at all? Then we can create a model that looks like this. And again, there are multiple models here. You can come up with different factors for what a second-hand or a third-hand win is worth. These are ways of modeling reality. They're ways of predicting the future, what would happen if this team played this team, given they haven't played each other yet. It's really up to you. This is a tool for you to use, and you can use it however you see fit. All right, that is everything about dominance matrices.